Good evening. I'll point out uh, Susan Carney, our school board chair, is with that, and also John Lawrence. They're way back here in the back. Um, I'll go ahead and get started. This is a really kind of hard task for me because there's so much information, so I'm trying to not do too much overload, but uh, we're going to give it our best shot. First of all, I just think it's really important that people understand how the budget was crafted. Um, and when you look at these three pictures, you're really looking at the first one is of a student. We always think about what's best for our children. We also had a huge community visioning last summer. I know several of you uh, took part in that from around the city. It involved people from all different areas, from city council, from school board, uh, community members who had children, didn't have children, that actually it was in this room, a wonderful event, but just really to make sure that we knew uh, what is the vision that the city wants for our schools. And then last but not least, of course, our teachers and our staff and making sure that um, we are able to maintain and support the excellent staff that we have. Out of our community visioning, we had a, had a triennial plan that emerged, and I just want to make sure that people understand what those components are that we really look at in the budget. The first one is 21st century teaching and learning, and we think about it as kind of everything classroom oriented and what we need to do to be on the cutting edge and to stay the awesome instructional environment that we are. Um, excellent staff. You know, Falls Church is Falls Church because we have outstanding teachers, support staff, administrators, and, and we want to maintain that in the coming years. Also, modern and secure schools. This used to say modern and, and small schools, but we have come to the realization this year that we are not going to have small, tiny schools. And so we really want to embrace kind of our new growth and who we are. We also have readiness for learning. I think this is probably, I guess I would say, a very proud aspect of the work that we do in Falls Church City Public Schools. And it's really making sure that every child has what they need to be successful in our schools. And that's not only social services, psychological services, instructional services, music, art, all of the things that we need for the whole development of children. Small classes. And in some regards, when I say small classes, it's really maintaining class size. And I say that because small means different things to different people. And in some school districts, small, they may be saying 15 or 16. Um, some school districts, small, might be 27. For us, it's 22 in kindergarten and first grade, and 24 for all of the grade levels after that. That's what our school board policy is set at. And then our last um, community visioning piece of our triennial plan this year is really responsible fiscal management. And I really commend the school board this year in that we took on an efficiency study for the first time and I'm twisting myself here. Um, and with the efficiency study, it was conducted by an outside firm called Gizman Consulting. They've actually done a lot of efficiency studies around Virginia, also around the country. And they looked at um, division management and administration. And again, this is really looking at our operations. Are we operating efficiently? Um, are we spending our money well within each one of these departments? Financial management, human resources, technology management, facilities management, student transportation, custodial services, and food services. So really digging into all of our operational areas. And overall, uh, I think this is a comment that I've I, I can't emphasize enough that we are a lean organizational structure. We're not an organizational structure that pads the top of the administration. We are really trying to focus our dollars where our children are in classrooms with our teachers. We've cut our administration costs since 2011 by 6.1%, and our administration costs per student on a per student is 14.1%. We've seen a decrease. And again, that is really trying to take care of the instructional aspect of our school division. Probably two of the, there are several combinations, but the two that I know I'm most proud about is we have worked hard to have position consolidations and changes. We're not afraid of change. We know that growth brings change, and it means somehow, sometimes we just have to operate a little bit differently, and we've worked really hard to do that. Um, but also our shared services with the City of Falls Church. This is a question we get every year during the budget. People will say, would you please consolidate services? And we always say, we do, um, and we're really proud that we do. Most of the community just is not aware. And I know this is a teeny tiny slide here, but this is not meant to be comprehensive. Um, but we share ground maintenance, fiscal management systems, uh, purchasing, bank reconciliations. We have an external auditor that we share. 
Um, all of our buses are repaired at the garage with the city. Obviously, the crossing guards, resource officers, all are shared with the police department. Um, facility usage, this building, all buildings are used almost 24-7, um, and we share those. Contracted technology hours, a lot of people don't realize we very closely tied with technology. Um, integrated phone systems, we're all under one system. Our network intrusion systems are all the same and work together. Um, our urban forestry, all of our trees and all of those aspects, we don't contract out for that, we work with the city. Um, construction coordination is enormous for us right now. Snow, snow removal help, emergency management team, we're very closely coordinated with the city. Fire marshal services, um, and just general microphones and televisions, all of those things that, that you would need in your operational budget, we are very closely tied, and again, this is not meant to be comprehensive. Also, when you look at our spending by category, um, the area that's in the green is really where we want to see that number continue to grow. This is a really high number. Um, to have 76% of our budget spent on instruction, that's the goal, that's where we want to be, and we've seen that increase each year, and it's hard to increase in that area, because it means some, you're cutting from somewhere else. Some of the challenges that we face, and I don't think this is a shock to anybody, uh, rapidly increasing student enrollment. And I think this number is key, that in the next three years, we should have another 559 children. Um, that's more children than are enrolled at any age right now. So when you think about that, in three years, it's a lot of little kiddos. That's what the trend line looks like. Um, 2013 is right here. The red is where we would be next year. So we're preparing right now for 172 children. And when you look, this is another, I think, an aspect that a lot of people just don't realize because we're tiny, but we are the fastest growing school division in Northern Virginia. And, you know, I've had people say, why do you think that is? Um, I think there's a lot of different reasons. We're a very small, close-knit community. We have great community events here. And you feel like you're part of, I know I grew up in a small town in Oklahoma, that Midwestern. It feels more small town, but you're right next to all these great services. And, of course, the schools. And I know one thing I hear from parents, and there may be people in the room, um, when you move into Falls Church City, you know where your child will go to school. And most of the surrounding divisions that have been growing are going through lots of redistricting. So wherever your child starts, there's no guarantee that's where they're going to be two years from now. So we're hearing that from parents. We're very, we're very settled as a school division. Our growth rate next year is predicted to be the highest we have, which is just over 7%. And people always ask, where are they coming from? That's just, I hear that question all the time. And they're coming from everywhere. And I just wanted to, and actually I have a handout that just shows the housing. Only reason I can hand out before, because then you would just be looking at it, because it's kind of fun. Um, so you can hand both of those out if you like. And on the housing chart, what we will see is that we've really tried to start to drill down about where are our children coming from. And that's why we know they're coming from apartments, they're coming from condos, the single biggest driver, single family homes. You know, we have a lot of houses in Falls Church where grandma and grandpa are selling their house and the family's moving in. And I know on all of your streets, you see that happening where more and more families are appearing. Um, what Mr. Kimball and, and the PTA representatives are passing out is the sort of data where we go in and we really look at every single child, where they live, um, so that we can stay on top of this. Uh, we're coordinating very closely with the city and the Economic Development Office. And so any of the um, new developments that are coming in, we actually have those um, factored into enrollment pro projections going out with a low, middle, and high. And, um, we go as far, I mean, it's not really reflected on this sheet, but then we start looking at condos, we start looking at apartments. We even look at how many children come from one bedrooms, two bedrooms, and three bedrooms. And we do that because it helps us know if there's going to be a new development, really how many children we expect to get from that development. So we're doing a lot of work very closely with the city um, to make sure that we're doing the very best we can to work together. Some of the other challenges, we do have aging facilities, again, um, with the exception of some of those facilities like TJ, uh, where we just did a renovation. We do have old HVAC in most of our buildings. We have uh, poor ADA access, inadequate electrical, uh, old roofs, we're trying to do a roof repair just this week at Mason. Um, aging pipes can be a challenge for us. So we have to build all of those things into our budget because we don't have heat, we don't have air, and roofs leaking everywhere, that's not okay. 
So we're working on all of these, and in a little while, I'll show you the capital improvement slide. Also, another challenge for us is mentoring new staff. It's really important that staff are part of our greater school community and that they understand Falls Church um, and they understand our expectations. And we are adding staff faster than ever in our history. So really helping to cultivate and grow uh, with our culture is really important. But I would also add that the craft of teaching is changing faster than ever in our history. And those of you that work in a technology sort of world know how technology has changed. So most of our teachers, many of our teachers, are using tools that didn't even exist when they went to college. So they're also having to really rapidly learn new skills as a teacher. Maintaining small class sizes. In our work plan, our school board is very committed um, to trying to maintain class sizes. And so when you look, this would be uh, 13, 14. It's just giving you an idea of when we add a teacher, you always look down at this. They went from fourth grade to fifth grade. Here you're going from seventh to eighth. This is the same trend line we expect to see next year in that we want to maintain the numbers where they're supposed to be by school board policy. So when I talk about adding staff, because we're growing, these numbers don't drop in a huge way uh, where all of a sudden we're going to see 19s or 18s. The staff we're adding is to maintain our school board policy. We also need to close the gap on teacher pay, and this is something that um, is becoming increasingly more evident in Falls Church as the gap has widened and widened for our teacher salaries. Um, when we compare ourselves to Arlington, we are lower on every step at every level. And as you can see in some of those levels, this is just a little snippet, some of the levels are $20,000. And when you can go one mile in the other direction, and still have a class of 23 or 24 children, it is the same job. Um, it gets increasingly more difficult for someone to say, I love Falls Church enough um, to stay for $20,000 less. That's just real life. And especially if they have kids in college or, or little ones at home. So, Also with challenges, these are just those annual increases that are typical for a school division. Um, VRS is increasing 22.8% this year. City retirement, we have that at 8%. Healthcare, this is a moving target, so right now we've got it at 13 and a half. Um, it could be 14, it could be 12 and a half, that's something that's still being negotiated. Some of our budget priorities this year that you see when you, when you look inside the budget book, or if you watch the presentation that I did on the, um, the superintendent's recommended night, we want to recruit, retain, and compete. That goes right along with teacher salaries. If we can get them straight out of college, we want to be able to get best and brightest. Um, so they have to be, we have to have an entry level salary that is enticing to those very best. We also want to retain those teachers in the middle. If we have a teacher who's been with us for 10, 12 years, if that teacher leaves us, um, on average, we lose about $50,000 in professional development that leaves with them. Because training is a huge piece of really being an excellent teacher and understanding all of the programs um, that go along with, especially within our school division. Maintaining class size is a priority. Enhanced technology integration. We'll have a whole work session where we really dig into technology. Um, I hear probably more parents ask about if the STEM education, and Noreen and I were just talking about that today. What are we doing with science, technology, engineering, and math? Um, our, our technology integration plan, um, we have a technology advisory committee right now made up of teachers from all of our schools. We have community members, we've had an infrastructure team, uh, very comprehensive that are putting together the finishing touches on a technology plan that we're really excited about. Also our enhanced hybrid learning curriculum. This probably impacts high school um, more than any other level. And hybrid means you have a blend of online curriculum with a face-to-face -face teacher. And we really want to have a focused effort to continue to enhance hybrid learning um, and make that a really rich, robust, one of the best hybrid learning programs in the country because it gives our students lots of flexibility. In Virginia, our students must take an online class. They also must have finance and economics. So instead of putting that completely on the schedule where kids have to take that, we offer that also in hybrid. And that's probably one of our biggest courses right now because students want to free up their schedule to take something else. And with hybrid learning, um, just yesterday we had an enrollment of 20 more students uh, coming into the second semester and we're trying to figure out how to staff for that. But hybrid is really a growing area for us. Also with our eighth grade moving back to MEH, 
We, um, the high school has talked a lot about making sure we continue to have great options for eighth graders, and hybrid also feeds into that. We have some eighth graders who may want to reach up and take class early. Uh, they may want to have an eighth uh, period class so that they're able to have more options in their ninth or their tenth grade year. So the high school is really uh, working right now to develop more in that area. We're also in our second year of NYP, and that's the middle years program under the International Baccalaureate. Many of you are here, or you have children at the elementary, obviously, that are in the PYP. NYP is where we had kind of the gap in the middle. Um, it was in the budget several years ago, and then when things got really difficult, the school division stopped, and so now we've picked it back up again. It's worked out in our favor, um, because NYP totally revamped their curriculum and their approach during that time to be more 21st century. So it was actually perfect timing, and it's worked out great. In the budget this year, we're in our second year. It will be three years, it takes the third year to we're actually certified in YP. When I talk about maintaining class size, I just think it's good to show you the list. That's a lot of teachers. Um, this is the staff that is needed in Foster City for next September to keep our class sizes um, where they need to be. And again, we're not talking teeny tiny class sizes. Um, kindergarten, first grade, second grade, third grade, fifth grade, sixth grade. We also have an encore teacher we need for MEH, uh, world language time. We need sections of math, science, history, um, English at George Mason. We have a special education teacher. We need increased counselor time at TJ. We need increased assistant principal time at TJ and Mount Daniel. You know, Mount Daniel grew um, just over 19% in kindergarten this year. Their assistant principal is only there 15 hours a week. That's not enough. Um, Mrs. Laco probably agrees. <laughs> um, we also have uh, we need increased music, art, media, and world language. And again, I'm not sure most people even realize that we've been really careful in how we've added staff. When we got to the point we needed a little bit extra, we didn't just hire a full-time teacher. We have hired exactly what we needed, so none of these positions at Mount Daniel have even been full-time. We are big enough now, we need a full-time person. We cannot run our schedule without it. Um, we also have a special education li liaison at MEH, and this year we're adding an assistant director of teaching, learning, and achievement, and that's really to help another department that's growing leap and bounds, um, and really looking at a focused position for a lot of our at-risk population. This is our historic per pupil spending. Um, what I would say, and this is dollar for dollar, so there's no inflation adjusted. Where we are this year is just, just barely above where we were in 07. Um, so we're really trying to do a lot more with less, because if you adjust this number for inflation, it's just over $12,000. This is our historic enrollment and spending, and again, uh, this is not a surprise to anybody, it just is what it is. Um, since 2007, we've grown 36%. But when you look at our funding, again, we are really trying to do a lot um, with a lot more kids. So this year we ended up, when the year was said and done, uh, just under 1%. In this budget, it would be a 1% 1, a 1 increase from where we were in 2007. But again, that's a lot of children that we've added. And when you look at the superintendent's proposed budget, and I, that's one thing I meant to say at the first that I, did, I did, forgot, and that is that this is proposed because this is the time of year where the school board has a lot of work to do on the budget. Um, so this is just what I have proposed to the school board and they go to work. Um, when you look at, this is the number everybody always wants to know in Falls Church is what the city transfer is. And the increase in the city transfer this year that we're asking for is three point, just over 3.5 million, which is a 10.6% increase. And the question that I get is why do we need the increase? And I think it's really important to note that 1.8 million of that is mandated. Whether we don't, if we wanted to cut it out of the budget, we can't. Um, we have VRS commitments, we have health, we also have city retirement. These SOQ positions are the standards of quality that are required by Virginia. So we don't have a choice to not add a special education teacher or even for our counselor ratios. We have ratios that we have to adhere to for the state of Virginia. So half of that increase is what we have to do. There's another 1.3 million that was that big long teacher list. Um, most of those positions are actually, that's just to maintain our class size and stay where we are. That's the biggest bulk of the transfer. Um, so 3.1 million of that is just for mandated and for class sizes, not teacher raises or anything else. And then when you look at, okay, we'll take that city transfer, how much does that leave us? 
that leaves us with about 470,000 from the transfer that's not committed for mandated or just to hire teachers. And then this year, we're lucky enough that we are growing and we get another 100, 330,000 from the state. Federal went down, but luckily we don't get a lot of federal money. So when you put those two together, um, after we do the teachers and we do the mandated, leaves us about an extra $800,000 for all of these other things that we need to do. And that is staff salary improvements, materials, all of the classrooms that we'll be setting up for kindergarten, first grade, second grade, all of those. Usually it's under between fifteen dollars and $20,000 just to set up a classroom. Um, one bus, which is in our budget again next year, um, is $100,000, anywhere from eighty-five dollars to one hundred. dollars So it's not a lot. And I, I point that out because that's why the increase to the transfer is tied to student enrollment. If we weren't growing, we wouldn't, we wouldn't need all the new staff. If we weren't growing, we would be meeting SOQs, standards of quality hiring, without adding new staff. On the capital improvement side, and I know that I'm very asked that I touched on this, this is um, found in our capital improvements plan and also online, but it shows you kind of how the building projects are set out right now. For Thomas Jefferson, we just finished the uh, building in the Occupy this year. We do have an HVAC that we is in the CIP that we will come back and put in, not this summer, but the following summer. All of the um, ducting, the ceiling, everything was done when we were inside the building last year. But believe it or not, HVAC for TJ is $2 million. And we felt like we could get um, at least two more years of life out of the system. And so we put that on, and that'll just be a summer project. Doesn't have to mess anything up. It's actually not a difficult project. Cherry Street renovation for preschool. Um, we're in kind of the design build portion right now, working very hard um, trying to get that building together. Um, we meet weekly. Um, Mount Daniel right now has a request for a proposal that's out. And you can see a schedule here where we're hoping to be building uh, right over the next two years, planning and building. And I've got another slide I'll show you on that. George Mason is the one that is probably pretty aggressive, what you see on here. Um, this is what we put in the CIP. And again, I think that's more than anything to say to the community. Everybody recognizes that high school is an issue for us and that we're going to do our very best to be as aggressive as we can, but also responsible and smart about how we move forward with the building. Um, Mary Ellen Henderson also is a project that's timed somewhat with George Mason because it's all here on the same campus. So when you look at our pre-kindergarten, this picture would now be yellow as of today. That's one thing that's changed. It's color. Um, but this is what it looks like um, where it over sits on Cherry Street. It has not been named. That's something the school board will be doing over this next month or two. When you look at Mount Daniel, um, the request for proposal that we have out right now is to look and see, can we create Mount Daniel to be a K2 model, K12? And the reason for that, when you look out and you start seeing what's happening with our two elementaries, um, our growth is so large in kindergarten and first grade that those cohorts of children continue to move through the schools. So when you look at the projections, and again, this is just over six years, um, you've got a school at TJ that now is 900 that's built for 750 with what we just finished. So we know that we need a good strategy to help with our elementary. So when we look at a K2 model in a 345 building, um, it starts to balance our buildings out and gives us a lot more time freeing up a whole grade level at TJ. So that's what the school board is exploring this year. Hopefully by this summer, uh, we'll be able to really review the proposals that come back to see if it's very doable um, to be able to increase that Mount Daniel to a K-1-2. And again, it's, I think for most of us that are educators that are especially have an early childhood background, we love the idea because second grade is still early childhood. This is our current capacity at Mount Daniel. And we have capacity charts for all of these, and I didn't put them all on here tonight, but just to keep in mind that their building is 275, their trailer sells them to be 370, but here's where they are right now. So there is not one little inch of space left. Um, and, and I know Ms. Laco's office back in the back, there's a small classroom that used to be office space or conference room, actually. Um, it literally every inch of the building is used for classes and for space. At George Mason, uh, just recently in our first meeting is next week, um, we are formed a process and planning group that has been formed. It's a very small group of two city council, two school board,
Planning Commission, uh, that, that should be one actually, Economic Development Authority, and the City Manager and myself. And again, this is just to look at what is the process and the planning we need to go forward uh, with this huge project for the city that's, that's coming online. So this is to let you know that we are on it and we're moving forward. When you look at the NEH edition, um, we do want to make sure the addition is coordinated when we do the high school. That's the most cost effective time. Right now, it's in the CIP to happen at the end of George Mason expansion. But it's also just to note that you know they're not very far away. They're built for 600. So um, when you look at this, this is next year. The following year, they're projected to be a 591. So they, this building will be full in two years, um, as far as capacity is concerned. The third year, they start hitting about 50 over. Now the good thing is, you at least have those little library spaces and places you can take up for a while. It's not instructionally the best thing, um, but you know we'll be able to make it through here for a few years by using every space that we can. Um, it makes it harder on specialist teachers, and I know that uh, not Daniel next year. I think everybody will be on cart. It's hard to travel from class to class and teach music or teach art or um, any of those kind of extra programs and really do your very best job. And just in, in closing here, this is to show you that on our website, if you go to sbcps.org and you click on the school board tab, I think this is one of the most important tabs where it answers a lot of questions for people. And there's a budget tab. And under the budget tab, you can find the full PowerPoints, um, all of the work session documents. The, when, when anytime the school board meets, we put them under here. They're also on the, on, you can look on the board agenda, but it's an easy spot to find them. We also get people who email questions, Q&A. So if someone emails us a question about the budget, we answer the question and we post them here, and you see them start to build throughout the budget process. Um, the other thing I want to point out is that, um, of course, school board policies and things like that, but this master's facility plan, um, this is where we put all of our construction information. Now, we're going through another update with that, because as you can imagine, it changes all the time. Um, and once that's updated, you can always find it here, but we are going to put a big icon on the front page of our web page too, just to make it easier, because we have a lot of construction going on right now. Probably two of our next uh, big meetings for the budget are Saturday, which is this Saturday, there's a work session at Central Office, and then on that following Tuesday, we actually have a public hearing. So all of those are open meetings, and we encourage you to come. And, uh, and join and listen. And of course, you can always email questions to us, and we're more than happy to answer any questions about the budget, about facilities, anything that we can do to make sure our community is informed. Now, do you want to take questions now? Okay. If anybody has a question, okay. Um, you, you showed that growth chart, and like the, we, we keep growing and growing. Do you, do you not think it's going to level out? I don't know, like, or is it just going to keep growing and growing? Well, and, you know, unfortunately, I wish that was an easy question to answer. It's hard that we do contract with Weldon Cooper. And that's the one thing I would say is that we don't rely on just our own expertise. Uh, Weldon Cooper looks at birth rate. So they're looking at the number of children that are actually born uh, to families that live in Foster City. So the baby could be born anywhere if they live here. Um, and then we are, we're going in and working very closely with economic development to look at all of the developments that are coming online. That's probably one of the most difficult pieces for us right now because we don't really know. We haven't had a lot of development in Falls Church. So we're going to be watching very closely um, with the economic uh, department. We use a low, middle, and a high range for the school. We use the middle. We're not using the high range for enrollment. Um, if we come in at the high range, you'll see these adjusting. Um, we're not using the lowest because nobody really feels like that's accurate either. So we've gone with the middle range and so has the city. Um, then the other piece are single family homes. And again, you know, there's so many homes that are turning over to where families are moving in. We do go on and see how many houses have sold. We watch all of that. Um, the other thing that we're watching right now that we don't necessarily have, I'd say, a full grip on yet are the split lots. Um, Many of you aren't probably aware if you have a property that's a split lot or could be. Watching to see how many lots get split. Because if, let's say it's 30 lots, and you end up with 60 houses instead of 30, and every house has 2.5 children, that 30, you know, there's a couple of classrooms of children. So. Um, for the schedule for the development for George Mason, you said that that proposed schedule was very aggressive. By that, did you mean that it all might happen later in following years? 
I, I think there's so much on this campus, and I think everybody knows with the water referendum, that um, one aspect of this property that's totally different uh, than it would have been if you asked that question two or three years ago, is 30% of this property could be developed, um, not for school use, but for general use. And that's a whole big question that we're gonna have to partner very closely with the city to figure out what is the best way to move forward on a property, um, and really looking at, because you don't want to build a new high school and then realize you built it in the wrong spot. So it's kind of like everything has to work together, and that's why we've got the committee going. Um, and it takes, you know, just permitting alone, getting plans, getting community buying, what do you want a high school to look like? Um, we've got a lot of work to do on that property, so on here. So it's, it could be pushed back, um, but it's one of those things until we really get into the process, we won't know. You got a yes? That's easy. All right, so speaking of the water referendum, um, Karen Sharp, he's been a school board member since I believe 1988, is that correct? Where is he? There he is. <laughs> um, there you go. Very involved in the community. Um, he's going to talk to us a little bit about that facilities plan in the context of all the other things that are going on on, that piece of, on this piece of property. Thanks, Doreen. How do I do that? Sorry. Uh, I made up a handout that has two sides to it. I hope you've had a chance to look at. I'm trying to conserve time for your comments and questions by uh, passing that out. The narrative part looks beyond the water sale. And the other side is uh, kind of a collapsed, uh, consolidated, uh, list of information. Some of it is uh, referenced as Dr. Jones was uh, indicating. Uh, there is on the school board website a school board triennial plan. You'll see a separate uh, line for that under, under the school board. And that's a three-year plan that includes both facilities and pro programmatic types of changes. Uh, and I encourage you, encourage you to look at that. Uh, we also have a staff work plan that goes hand in hand with that. Uh, triennial plan that covers the same basic time periods, more detail. The CIP, Dr. Jones also showed a, a slide from that indicating what the uh, uh, progression is of our plan to, to build at the different locations. And I've collapsed that into the next little group there. You'll see I have Jerry Street, Mount Daniel, MEH, and George Mason, and indicated uh, what is the, the, the time when we're going to be building on each of those sites, what is the time we're scheduled to occupy. Now you may notice that there's a difference between uh, what was on the slide here and what's on our, uh, on our CIP that we, uh, that we adopted in December as to uh, the Mount Daniel project. It says that uh, we're going to occupy Mount Daniel in 2017, September 2017. Well, our RFP asks our bidders to come back with a plan to have us occupy at Mount Daniel by September of 2017. So that's a, a difference you should know. Now, uh, a couple questions focused on George Mason, and uh, I'll just say uh, uh, Occupy there is scheduled for September 2018, and Occupy for MEH, an addition for that is September 2017. Now that, uh, these, these, uh, Building changes also imply, as Dr. Jones pointed out, some shifts again in where the grade, grades would be located. So once the Mount Daniel plan uh, is finished, if we get an RFP like we uh, hope we will, uh, that will mean a, a shift in grade levels. So we have K2 at Mount Daniel, and then 3-5 at, at uh, Thomas Jefferson. And then the next group is trying to show you what, how we're staying in pace with the capacity that we expect by, and all of these are geared towards September of 2017. And if you see the capacity, uh, it's indicating that we have uh, capacity uh, for 792 at K, at, uh, in the K2 area, uh, but we don't have projected students for 6, 685 by September of 2017. And each of the items on that list, I think you'll see we're tracking pretty closely uh, so that we keep pace as we're building uh, with the capacity that we anticipate. And I think if you, uh, if you look at uh, what's happening in other jurisdictions around us, 
uh, we're doing a pretty good job of keeping pace. Uh, I, I know we still have trailers, uh, but uh, in a relative sense, I think you'll see we're, we're doing pretty well. Okay. Um, we can make some changes in, in these plants. Uh, the training plant calls for changes as, as we need to uh, make them. Uh, so, so too does the CIP. Uh, and really these changes, uh, they, they basically come from uh, our attempts to represent what, what the community wants. And I'd like to hear much about that in, in just a few minutes. I want to point out uh, that th these are uh, plans that go out uh, uh, five years uh, but there are also buildings and building renovations that will last for 20, 30, maybe 50 years. And what the program's going to look like in 50 years, <laughs> uh, we have to try to anticipate. Uh, we already have changes on, ongoing uh, that, we're, that we're, Dr. Jones pointed out tonight, some of the technology changes, the, the uh, different uh, things that we're, that we're planning to do at, uh, at Cherry Street, that would be uh, uh, new things in, in preschool. So there, there are things that, that we need to do in the short run, but remember these building plans, again, are very, very long term. Uh, they mean programmatic uh, reviews that uh, would look into various kinds of, of changes in program. I tried to outline some of those in the third paragraph on the narrative side. One that I, I want to point out that we're advocating for uh, with this General Assembly and boards around Virginia, and we, I think, are having some success in advocating for a change in the SOLs, the high stakes tests that we've been experiencing uh, ever since 1994. Uh, those uh, changes will mean a reduction in the number of the high stakes tests that your students will have to take uh, if, if the bills are successful. And uh, we're really trying, again, in a programmatic way to, uh, to shift here from what, what used to be a, a class by class based system of trying to measure progress, shifting over to an individual growth based measure of individual progress. We still want to have accountability for that, that individual growth, but, but uh, we're, we're, change, we're shifting from uh, you know, measuring one class against a, another class to to measuring how well we're doing with individuals. Comments or questions, please? Yes? I saw, and this was interesting, I saw in here the uh, piece about you know, shrinking the space here, that, you know, you're going to have less room at um, the high school, right. and maybe moving some of the online learning. You know, <coughs> elsewhere, I know that's not you know, even remotely a done deal, but that's just, can you talk a little bit about that, maybe in conjunction with the hybrid learning? That Dr. Jones was talking about? Well, those changes, uh, we, Dr. Jones is the co chair of a statewide task force on virtual or hybrid learning. In fact, she's, she's sort of been a champion for the hybrid learning uh, end of that, of that uh, possible spectrum that, that, is, uh, that fully represents the virtual learning. And as we uh, again think about the long term here, uh, we will be potentially losing 30% of our ground space, but having many more students to accommodate here. It does involve potentially some more online learning, uh, but there are also, uh, uh, during our visioning process last summer, we heard a lot of demand for apprentice-type uh, education, uh, things that might occur in businesses off-site. Uh, and then there could be college-level courses that could be um, taken at community college or elsewhere. So it is, it's, yes, it does involve hybrid online, uh, but it involves other uh, potential changes as well. We need to, we, we need to work with you all uh, over this course of time to make sure that, uh, that we get uh, the right kind of uh, facilities to accommodate the, the changes and, and uh, do it at the right pace. Yes? This might be a question for Dr. Jones, but it, it came clear on your paper. Why, why are, is the high school the last thing that they're building? Why are they building onto MEH before they're, before you're thinking about building onto the high school? Well, I, again, if you look at our capacity, uh, there, there is a capacity change. Uh, we have 
some capacity at the high school that still is uh, is open, at least relative to our other buildings. And then, as Dr. Jones pointed out, we have this partnership that we need to work out with the city over how we would uh, deal with the, the water sale agreements provision uh, to potentially permit 30% of our of our ground space here at MEH and, uh, and GM to be used for potentially commercial purposes. Sorry, can I clarify? I, sure. I'm thinking I heard your question, but and I'm correctly, but we're actually building high school, George, George Mason before MEH. And that was the slide that I had. So it's on our CIP, so that it's closely, it's done at the same time, so they're using the same construction team. But NEH on our CIP is to come at the tail end of Mason. And so really right now, the biggest issue with Mason is the planning piece. That's enormous for us. So we may need some adjustment uh, there. As I said, the CIP and our RFP has a little bit of a difference. I think the CIP, as, as Dr. Jones has just described, may have a may need an adjustment there for MDH and, uh, and uh, GM. Other questions? Comments? Yes, ma'am. You mentioned um, the, the efforts to work with the state on, on the SOLs. I'm wondering, what's the you know timeline that you could even possibly think that, might, that those changes might occur in? Well, uh, my understanding is that the reduced number of of tests would, would come at the elementary level uh, and that, that those uh, reductions would take effect for the 2014-2015 school year. Uh, so uh, they, they would go more to, to an emphasis on reading and math uh, in, the, uh, in those early uh, time periods and uh, only have a more periodic look at science or social studies or the others that we're doing sort of on an annual basis right now. Yes? Um, I'm curious, maybe you haven't gotten this far in the planning, but I'm wondering in terms of the new construction, uh, aside from classroom space, what are the other considerations for facilities additions that are being added? For example, uh, here we don't really have much of a performing arts space. Um, there's no orchestra program, no strings program in, in the system. Has there talk of adding more spaces for not only STEM, but also arts and music and other aspects that are important to the curriculum? Well, we have a design phase that uh, comes at uh, a later point, really. That we're, we're at the um, at the RFP stage, we work out a program that we ask the bidders to provide for us, and that's already taking effect at TJ. But then we'll, we'll go into a design phase, I'm sorry, Mount Daniel. We'll go into a design phase of Mount Daniel with a, an architectural selection advisory committee after the RFP is, is in. And so we'll, we'll be still working out the details of the design there. With, with later schools, with MEH and with uh, GM, we'll have that same kind of progression where, where we will have much of the program will be defined you know, before we have an RFP, but we'll still have additional design programming during a, an architectural selection advisory committee phase uh, after, that, after that bidding is, is initially done. And those, those time periods are, well, again, going back to Mount Daniel, uh, we just did the workup for the RFP uh, at Mount Daniel beginning in, in August, and we completed that in, in December. Very intensive staff work to get that done. Uh, and then the, the design phase after that would go on for another uh, six months or so uh, after, the, after the bids come in. And uh, you know, we'll, we'll, we have that, that length of time for staff input, for parent input, uh, to get, get those designs worked out in detail. Yes.
Cooper is kind of the official local government consultant for Virginia. They're, they're affiliated with the University of Virginia. And they, they advise all the localities. They're capable of advising all the localities in Virginia. They have detailed information for each locality. So they're, they're the uh, creme de la creme of, of the, the uh, folks that we could consult with uh, in, in Virginia. Now, we, we have had some other, some other private consultants uh, attempt to, uh, to work for us. And I, I must confess, that was not a good experience. We had, we had uh, well, I won't name names, but we had a, a consultant uh, prior to our building here, and then uh, later on in the phase where we did the master facilities plan. And uh, I was not nearly as pleased with those consultants as with Weldon Cooper. Weldon Cooper did much better. Can I just add to that, too? And I just want to point out too that also with Weldon Cooper, they do the projections for the state of Virginia for the uh, VDOE. The other chart that I handed out tonight, because it's a question I get all the time, is how close are our projections actually um, for us every year? And you'll see the trend line is right there. We also have what we call the Kimball Projections, who is our finance director. I think he just stepped out actually. Does a brilliant job and uses different formula that he has, and they mirror Weldon Cooper almost every year. The most difficult aspect of school enrollment for us right now is kindergarten. Kindergarten, because the move-in rate from people outside other localities and other places to start their child here is a moving target. If we could get a handle on that, and we've gone through and ran all types of formulas, and there just is not uh, any correlation um, to the number of apartments or anything for the number of kindergartners. But once we get the kindergarten group, it's pretty easy because we're really good at projecting cohorts. Well, I just mentioned one last uh, difference in the different plans that you'll see, and that's uh, in our triennial plan, I think you'll notice uh, uh, that there is a mention of a pool at your place, but uh, in the CIP there is not at this point. But again, we have lots of details to work out. And I really want to encourage you to give us feedback on both the, this year's budget, on the uh, building plans that we have in the current phase, and in the long term. We, we, we want to reflect what the, what the community really, uh, really is asking for and what, what our students, of course, need. Uh, and uh, we only work that out with, with your cooperation. Thank you. All right, we have one more speaker tonight, and that is Wyatt Shields. He's the city manager, is responsible for the operations and administration of our city, and also for preparing the budget. And that budget, of course, includes uh, the school budget. So he's going to give us a little bit of a perspective from the city. And then after that, um, we're going to open the floor for questions. We also have, and I apologize again to Susan and John for not for not uh, uh, mentioning that they were here. So we have additional school board members. Um, we have all of these folks that have spent their time. So if another question pops in your head at the end here, we'd love to um, let you ask that. Thank you. Good evening, my name is Wyatt Shields. I'm your city manager. It's nice to be with you. I've been at this now, I think, four years in a row. So it's a tradition now. And traditionally, my role is to come and put a bunch of slides on the wall that gets everybody very anxious and uncomfortable <laughs> about the financial feasibility of our plans. And the truth of the matter is that at this point in the process, that is always the case. We always have a gap going into budget season. And um, in our capital planning, we always have a gap in our long-range uh, financial plan. And we always close it. And so we will do that again this year. But um, uh, we've got a lot of work, and we need a lot of community engagement to do that before we get there. Um, I've, before I start, I just want to uh, you know, Tony mentioned early on about all the coordination and collaboration that the city and the schools do. And she listed all the services that we do together internally and externally. But it's, it's so much more than that, too, I think. And just in terms of the way that a whole city functions on our scale with the way our rec and parks programs feed into our state championship athletic programs, the way our library serves uh, the whole community. Uh, the way our crossing guards interact. Uh, 
I have a, a daughter, and she has a good friend who recently moved from a neighboring jurisdiction into the city of Falls Church, and I asked her, what's the biggest change about living in the city of Falls Church? And she said, well, you know what I think it is? I can walk wherever I want to go, and my parents let me, and uh, because it's safe. And, uh, and we want to do more in the city to make it more walkable and make it um, even a, you know, a better place to live, and that's part of a whole city approach. It's learning, education, senior programs, the whole package. Um, but I want to talk a little bit about uh, the budget situation coming uh, up over the next couple of months. Just a little bit of budget 101. The uh, majority of our revenues come from real estate revenue. And I'll just note that, um, so this is 60% uh, comes from property taxes, real estate property taxes. 25% come from all other local taxes like sales taxes, meals taxes, business licenses. And this is all other revenues, uh, state funds, federal grants, um, and, and fees, fees for service is, is a decent chunk of that. That's your wreck and park fees, Edward. Of real estate, uh, about 22% of this slice is from commercial real estate. Um, and 5% is from apartments, and the rest is from single-family homes and townhouses. And so we are very highly dependent upon our, our single-family home uh, taxpayers, and our commercial sector of real estate has been flat for the past five years, and we forecast it will be flat again next year. We do have new growth, though. We have um, a Hilton Garden Inn Hotel, which is a significant contributor to real estate uh, tax growth in the coming year, as well as the Northgate project. So this is where the money goes, and 46% uh, of it is the school transfer. Uh, the school transfer, or the school, is, is uh, probably about two-thirds of our debt service as well to fund, fund our schools. Mary Ellen Henderson, uh, the Thomas Jefferson Elementary School that was just completed as, as two examples. Uh, going around the horn, uh, public safety is the next largest share of our budget. Public works is 6%, recreation parks and our library is 6% of our budget. Our health and welfare programs is 3%, community development 5%, and then overall uh, debt service is 6% of our budget. Our capital improvements program also, which I'll talk about in more detail, is about 3% of our budget. Next slide. So this is our revenue projection for next year. And uh, so beginning July 1st is when our fiscal year starts. And we're projecting overall a 5% increase in revenues. And that's, uh, and that's a healthy revenue growth for the city. That's actually our historical average. Uh, we do have healthy growth in the real estate side uh, with assessed values growing. Um, larger on the residential side than the commercial side, as I mentioned just a moment ago. Uh, the car tax has significant growth. Tom Clinton is here in the audience. Uh, good job, Tom. Uh, but that is all of our citizens, uh, like everybody in the country. A lot of them are refreshing their cars after going for a number of years without buying new cars. And that shows up in our tax rolls. All other revenues put together, modest growth of about 3.4%. So again, the bottom line is we'll have just from the economy alone, no, no changes in tax rates, about $3.6 million of additional funds for uh, 5% growth. Our annual budget in 2014 uh, was uh, $73.8 million. Next slide. So here's a, an initial gap projection. So with that uh, uh, pretty reasonably healthy revenue growth of 5%, and general growth rent were to grow at 3.8%. Um, and that number is derived from our projections back in November. And uh, the city council adopted a budget guidance statement to me saying uh, keep general government growth within the bounds of what the economy is providing in terms of revenue growth. And at that time, we were projecting about 3.8%. And so if we honor those numbers back in November, we'll grow at 3.8%. Uh, school division growth at the superintendent's uh, proposed budget. Our debt service is going to grow uh, by about a quarter of a million dollars uh, with the projects that have already been approved and the bonds have already been issued. Um, so our, our budget would grow by 7%. So obviously there's a gap. 
and the gap is about um, 1.4, 1.5 million dollars in terms of our projections right now, and so that would be about a five cent increase in the tax rate. And so the difficulty with that is on the residential side, which will show a larger than a five percent increase in assessed value, an increase in the tax rate is going to be something that the city council is going to um, um, not be anxious to do. I can maybe put it politely that way. And so we've got a lot of work to do still to close this gap. Um, part of the whole city approach is financial sustainability, and, um, and that's uh, what we'll endeavor to do with the budget. Uh, next slide. On the general government side, um, not including schools, but just on the general government side, just a picture about the last 10 years in terms of kind of how we, how our spending per capita compares with some of our urban neighbors, uh, comparing Arlington, Alexandria, and the city of Fairfax. And I compare us against the urbans because we all take care of streets, whereas the counties don't. And so there's a pretty big difference in terms of uh, the, the uh, portfolio of services. Um, but the city is and has dropped down since 2007 with the budget reductions uh, spending uh, less than we did in 2007 in terms of our general government budget, very similar to what Tony was talking about on the school side essentially flat over uh, over the recession years and uh, falling below on per, per capita spending relative to our urban uh, colleagues. Um, that's one thing which tracks just one indicator um, of cost of government per citizen uh, that we keep an eye on. Next slide. Um, the City Council's budget guidance to me, uh, review all operations for efficiency and continue to work with schools in collaboration on things that we can do together uh, more efficiently. Uh, revenue growth should be tied strictly to economic growth, read no tax rate increase for the general government budget. Uh, focus on capital needs and infrastructure and do so in a multi-year context. And so let me just talk a little bit about some of the multi-year things that we're looking at in terms of the uh, capital plan. Next slide. Um, looking out for the five-year planning period, um, we presented a draft CIP to the Planning Commission just this past week. And so the numbers in that CIP that the Planning Commission is looking at and comprises uh, the projects for general government uh, facilities, which includes the library, uh, fire station upgrades, and things like that, school improvements, uh, public works and transportation, including stormwater projects, um, recreation and parks, these are park improvements, and then and IT infrastructure for schools and general government, which is the, is the small slice. It's a big capital improvements program. Uh, all in, it's uh, uh, well over $130 million. So one of our challenges over the next couple of months is to prioritize the CIP to lay out in a five-year plan those things that we actually think we can achieve, both from a perspective of the staff resources that we have to execute projects, but also in terms of our, of our uh, tax rate. Next slide. Some of the projects that are familiar to us, a lot of these are already approved. Obviously, the Thomas Jefferson Elementary School, uh, but now we have uh, HVAC uh, repairs that are in the CIP. Uh, the North Cherry Street uh, project, is, uh, is funded um, and has been approved. Uh, we're going through the site plan uh, process right now. City Hall public safety improvements to improve our court uh, operations and meeting space. Uh, stormwater system improvements. Uh, transportation improvements citywide. We have new funding sources through the General Assembly's action last year. The city will benefit from and, um, and we'll be making pedestrian improvements, sidewalk improvements, particularly in our commercial districts. Our fire station um, uh, has improvements in the CIP. And then looking ahead, the really important ones in the, in the immediate term are the Mount Daniel expansion and library improvements. Again, there's a lot in the CIP. We do still need to prioritize our projects. Next slide. Here's our, um, our look at our debt service. And a couple things to point out about this. Historically, our debt service has in, been in this band between $4 million and $6 million per year, paying back principal and interest on all of our outstanding debt. 
We hovered at around five million per year, and then we benefited from about a $1.2 million drop off in debt service. Uh, some of us will remember, not me, but the old TJ uh, improvement project. That bond was fully paid off in 2011. And so we have historically low debt service today, and that's a good thing. Uh, looking ahead, however, if you, if you look at the projects that are uh, in the CIP, not including the high school of Mary Ellen Henderson, we get above our historic norms for debt service, approaching up to $8 million. And so that gap between where we are right now for debt service and where we're projected to go helps focus our need to prioritize the CIP for those things that really resonate the most are our highest needs in the community, and I think we still have more work to do there. Next slide. Um, just to sort of zoom in on it a little bit more, um, the increase in debt service uh, from uh, 15 to 16 is related to our TJ project coming fully online in terms of debt service, uh, City Hall, public improvements. And then in these years, Mount Daniel uh, coming online, the additional TJ uh, project, and then uh, the library project. So those are some sort of core general government and school CIP projects. Um, and, and you can see how the debt service is impacted by those. Uh, next slide. Uh, the city does right now benefit from uh, fund balance, fund, uh, fund balance reserves that are healthy. Uh, currently, uh, our policy is to maintain reserves that are 17%. This is our policy target of 17% of annual expenditures. That represents two months of, of expenditures for the city. We're currently above that. And so uh, with the CIP actions done by the city council last spring, and in the, in the CIP that we're proposing the planning commission right now, we'll draw those fund balance reserves uh, back to 17% of expenditures and then maintain that so that any surpluses are immediately turned into pay-as-you-go uh, improvements in our schools and uh, parks and facilities. Next slide. Uh, we have the, the boundary adjustment for the high school property, Mary Ellen Henderson uh, property. And so we are working uh, with the task force that was mentioned earlier um, on high school planning. And conceptually, uh, the idea is that if we can build a new high school and have it be more vertical in its orientation and use space more efficiently than our uh, current uh, single-story high school, uh, that there may be some property that's available for economic development. And that's our planning effort is to really to, to narrow in on that, determine what is appropriate for economic development on this school campus, what are the, the fundamental school needs uh, for space on this site. But the concept is, is that additional economic development somewhere on the site at the most appropriate site will help pay for the new high school improvements. And so it is viewed as a package. Next slide. Oh, sorry, can I ask yes. a question? I hope I'm not the only one in the room that's not fully understanding the picture. Oh. No. But could you just point to the part of the, uh, yes. the purple line? I don't quite understand, you know, the purple line. And where I should have, uh, I did this. Uh, so this is Haycock Road. Uh, we're here at Mary Ellen Henderson, right here. Uh, here's a football stadium, uh, Route 7 going this way. And so, with the, with the sale of the water system, we uh, agreed on a boundary adjustment that would bring this into the corporate limits of the city. And why that is important is that if we were to have economic development on this property in the future, the tax receipts from that development would accrue to the city. Uh, before the boundary adjustment, if there were any economic development on the site, it would go to the county and therefore would would not then be a part of a financing package. But so you're talking about the space where the school is now inside the red lines, having yes. So, you know, so, so the red lines represents the new city corporate limits. So I'm just not seeing a lot of space there for more economic development. Would that right. be right along the road? Well, that will be the challenge. <laughs> and and um, but conceptually, this is all one story. And so if that were. If we move to a four-story high school or a three-story high school, um, 
it would be a more efficient use of land. Uh, additionally, if there was options for structured parking or that, that type of thing, to use our land more efficiently, that's the precondition for there being any land that might be able to be used for economic development. Now, and it's early days, and so we need to go through a very rigorous planning process to make sure that our educational needs are being met, uh, market studies to, on feasibility, and um, but it's a very valuable piece of property with its transportation infrastructure, its location, and so uh, conceptually it's a sound value. You know, things like moving the fields halfway across town where our high schoolers would be driving back and forth to practice is not what people are thinking. Um, it has to be a plan that really works educationally, functionally for us. Uh, whatever's going to be developed would have to be appropriate to be next to a high school. So all of those things will be considered. And there are lots of things that you can do when you look around the country at compacted development for schools. You know, and probably a, a big piece that people don't think about is the soccer field that's there. It's a practice field the one that's just behind the MEH. And uh, that's something that, you know, in a lot of urban areas, you can put them on the roof. You can, there are lots of different things you can do with creative development. The other thing that we don't, that we don't show here um, is the amount of acreage that we use just for parking. And it's not that expensive to go to a multi-level parking, which actually can gain you acreage just by going multi-level. And I'm not still not a very good Virginia person knowing where I am, but I think it's T.C. Williams that's straight down that actually has this multi-level parking, which is a good example. So all of those things will go into to thinking. It'll take a lot of creativity. Well, under the terms of our agreement with Fairfax County, 70% um, of this for 50 years must be used for public educational purposes. And so the county stated very firmly that they do not want a situation where this is sold and developed for other reasons. That's not what we're looking to do, but, but that's not what, you know, they, they put that in the agreement because that's not an outcome that, that they wanted to have. The other obstacle is this is a 40-acre campus, and 40 acres of land in Northern Virginia, proximate to the city, doesn't exist. And so, um, no, there are no plans to move to high school. Yes? Can you, can you give an example of something that would be like an appropriate revenue-generating idea for something so close to a school? But what are some options that would be appropriate? Well, um, we will look at at uh, a mix of uses, I think is you know retail, um, office, commercial types of uses, um, residential uses is what the market wants to build, so we'll have to uh, consider that. But I think this, I think the city will be in the driver's seat. The city will do the planning and lay out um, what our criteria are if we were to partner with someone in the private sector um, to help us accomplish our our public school goals. 
Um, and their benefit would be to have some, some opportunity for some development. The next slide helps um, understand a little bit of, of why this is an important discussion to have. Under this scenario, um, the high school is currently projected very, you know, with very round numbers. So Mary Ellen Henderson and the high school together to be just about $100 million. And so for a city of our size to, um, to fund a $100 million project, is we, we just don't have the tax base to do that. Um, but if there were a, a, a partnership that we could have with the private sector that cut the cost in half, uh, we still have an enormous increase in debt service that takes us up into the, into the 12 million range relative to the 5 million range that we're currently um, experiencing. And so the, uh, the financing is very early. This, is, this chart is a blunt instrument to describe kind of the obstacle and the, the work that we need to do in terms of the feasibility of a new high school. And, uh, and we'll do that work. We'll close this gap, and I think we'll produce a good outcome. But um, that's why private development is part of the discussion to try to make this uh, closer in the realm of feasibility. Excellent. Um, so just a summary of, of challenges. To my mind, the, the chief challenge of the FY15 budget development cycle is the capital planning. Uh, the operating budgets, we do have a gap there, and we'll need to resolve that. But the capital planning, I think, is where the real difference is going to be made in terms of the decisions that get made over, over the coming months. Um, enrollment growth um, is a significant driver in our budgets. Our interjurisdictional contracts, we contract out fire very importantly, our jail services, our, our courts are uh, by contract in Arlington County, and we've been uh, working very hard to try to keep those costs under control, but they have accelerated very rapidly over the last uh, two years. Next slide. And I think this is my last one. Um, our schedule, this is all about uh, a budget adoption that would go into effect on July 1st, 2014, but to get there, uh, the council will adopt the budget in, um, in their fourth Monday in April. And we have a good number of, of public hearings and opportunities for input between now and then. Uh, the Planning Commission will adopt its uh, CIP recommendations to the City Council uh, in late February, and the School Board will vote on its budget request to the City Council in late February as well. And I'll present um, the combined CIP, School Board request, and general government budget to the City Council. <coughs> To accomplish the capital program, there is no way to avoid an increase in taxes, uh, to put it bluntly. And I think that is why it is um, necessary to build our operating budgets with an eye towards the long-term capital needs. But those need to be viewed together um, uh, so that what taxing capacity might exist in the community does not get uh, consumed or, or used up before we get to these needed capital projects. That's a, a really important consideration. Yes? Um, you, you had a slide up there about um, the general government per capita spending based, uh, compared to like Alexandria yes. and Arlington. What, what does general government spending include? What does that mean? I'm referring, when I say general government, I'm referring to everything um, outside of the school division. So that's, you know, our police. Rec and Parks programs, um, all of the uh, general government programs. Could you go back one slide? When you were showing the, maybe it's two, one more, the projected cost. That 50% of revenue generated is how realistic, I, I know we're not talking specifics and there's a lot of planning to do, but when we're talking about that offset of the 30% of the land that could be used for rev revenue generating purposes, 
I mean, is that, are you feeling pretty good about a 50%? This needs to be informed by the market analysis and the density analysis, um, but this would assume that together through either a combined uh, sale of land plus new ongoing revenue from economic development, that that would uh, take care of the equivalent of $50 million of debt service. Um, that's a big assumption, and it's not one that is backed up by a significant amount of analysis at this point. Our planning process is to get to the bottom of a much more granular financial plan. But, but without it being granular, we think we're kind of in that ballpark of what's possible when you're, what, I mean, to even put this plan together. I would that assumes a fairly significant amount of density on the land that is not used for school uh, property. Um, and I think that's probably about as far as I can say uh, about it. Yeah, but that would, I think that would um, imply significant commercial development. Do, do we have anything in the city that's comparable in terms of revenue generating? I'm just trying to get my head wrapped around what kind of, you know, business or, or series of businesses would generate that kind of revenue that's comparable to a piece of development we have right now. Well, um, if you take a rule of thumb that to uh, finance a million dollars of capital requires $100,000 a year, or 10% rule of thumb, so to finance $50 million of capital improvements requires uh, $5 million of new revenue. Um, the mixed use development that we've had in the city uh, to date, the Byron, the Spectrum, Pearson Square, um, uh, those being big ones, um, Spectrum, uh, generate a gross of about $5 million a year in taxes. So that's one off the cuff um, comparison. And what's their acreage, more or less? Their yeah, I'm not. I can't give you those numbers off the top of my head. But that um, that is. These are the types of questions that we will uh, need to answer with um, a lot more analysis. And I think we will get some clarity on it before we embark on a on a way forward. Yeah. Thank you. Do you know when we'll see any of the funds from the water system? Well, the uh, or, or let me read. yes. When? The, uh, specifically. Right. The, the, uh, the sale of the water system uh, will generate, uh, uh, we're currently uh, forecasting about $14 million of net proceeds. It will be higher than that um, as when, once all the, the books are closed. Um, and we're having a discussion with the city council on policy about the use of the sale proceeds. And I believe there's consensus on the council that what the council wishes to see those proceeds used for is to create a lasting uh, benefit for the community. Uh, to not have it be used for operating budgets, but have to create uh, something that is permanent and lasting and a permanent uh, financial benefit for the city as well. And so we're going through the different options on how best to achieve that. But you have not gotten any, there have been no questions. No, we closed on the water sale on January 3rd, and so on that date, uh, the majority of the sale proceeds actually were conveyed to the city, and they're, um, they're in the city's accounts. And um, it's uh, the reason, you know, the books on the water system have not yet closed. We have additional bills that are going out, we have additional bill, uh, bills that we're paying. And so, uh, you know, the final bills won't close out probably until uh, June 30th, the end of this fiscal year. Can't some yes. of those proceeds from the water sale offset Absolutely. the amount of debt that you're talking about? Yeah, in one form or the other, either through the investment and uh, directly into capital, the investment in an endowment fund that would generate revenue that would uh, buy down the debt service, investment in a pension fund, which would buy down the actuarially annual required contribution, which could then be redeployed towards capital. Those are three big ways um, that the sale proceeds will be used in our capital plan. 
And so those debt service projections uh, will be improved by that. But if you take that as a, again, sort of a rule of thumb, if it's $14 million, then that could improve the debt service picture by about $1.4 million, um, you know, ultimately. But we have uh, a significantly larger gap than that in terms of, of uh, debt service projections compared to where we are today. So it's a part of the solution, but it's something not the whole solution. Is that it? Thank you. All right. Th thank you all very much. And, and, uh, and uh, Mary Beth Connolly, a uh, member of council, is here as well. I don't know if she was introduced at the beginning, but uh, Mayor Carter is here, um, and others will, will stay here to answer questions. Thank you all. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, we're so lucky to have um, so many leaders from the community here in one night. Um, I just wanted to open one last, if anyone has a question for the schools, and bring it back into the schools a little bit. We're also really lucky to have three principals here um, from, from three of our school systems, as well as Dr. Jones. And I know we had a couple of very specific questions about curriculum items, like uh, the music programs and what we plan to do with that. Um, do we have any other questions that are kind of bringing closer to home that have just kind of been on your mind? It's just such a unique opportunity to have these people here. I wanted to make sure we address them. Anybody? I just have one um, focusing specifically on, we talk so much about um, supporting the teachers and the teacher benefits and, you know, the salary, the differences between the counties and all this stuff, but it's always been my biggest push is obviously to support the teachers. And I have to say, I keep hearing this persistent rumor that concerns me in terms of planning time for the teachers, and that is this early release Wednesday situation. So could you address that? Because the, the rumors keep coming. <laughs> yeah, and I, and I will tell you, they actually weren't part of my budget, but they're all coming to me too. And I don't know if there's anybody in here, Mary Beth's on SAO actually, where we've talked about it probably the last two SAO meetings. So it's coming from parents, it's coming from teachers. Teachers are concerned it may go away from parents, I probably hear more parents that say that would be awesome if it did go away, but that's more because of the expense. Um, it is for some of our families. Um, so will it be discussed in the budget in May? But what I can tell you is that even if we lost early release and we ended up getting to that point, um, it doesn't mean it would be a reduction in plan time. It means you have to do your master schedule, kind of goes back to what we talked about earlier, differently. And so truthfully, I see for a lot of our teachers, they're working on the schedule right now, it does have early release in there. We're actually trying to get equal plan time for all teachers. Right now it's not equal, and it hasn't been, so it depends which teacher you ask. If you're a teacher who's been having X amount of minutes of plan time, you've had a great schedule, then you love the schedule. If you're a teacher who's had minimal plan time, then not so much, and it hasn't been equal. I can say that the one thing we will make sure is that all the plan time will be equal, and it will definitely be equal to any other Northern Virginia school um, and robust because it's, it's critical. Teachers have to have plan time, they have to have time to be, to be together, they have to have time to prep for their classrooms. So I think it's a big discussion. Um, you know, on Tuesday night's uh, school board agenda, one of the things that, that, that will be on there will be a presentation from daycare. Daycare is struggling right now. We're out of space, which you know. Um, and those of you that access the daycare program, it's difficult when you have almost 200 children and you're trying to find quality staff to come and serve the needs of those children only on Wednesday. It's not a great job that somebody wants to take, you know, just to work on Wednesday afternoons because it doesn't pay lucrative. Um, so they're struggling right now, even on those components, and that's all part of growth. So I expect it will be a big discussion. Um, just simply because I have heard uh, the question uh, asked so many times. And Mr. Lawrence is back there. We talked about it with the teachers group just this week on PEAK. Um, and it just depends who you talk to. So I hope that answers a little bit. I think it will be discussed, but what I can say is we'll make sure teachers have plan time if we end up going in a different direction. So I think it's important to note that. Anybody else? Do we get revenue from the State Department or government or anything for all the families that are? No, and I think an expert on the State Department is actually right out here, just simply because she used to lead uh, on the State Department group and helping families relocate. We talked a lot about this last year, and she actually did an article for us in uh, Morning Announcements. And um, 
with Oakwood, it's, it doesn't matter whether you're State Department, whether you're just a family that moved here, um, the assessed value from the real estate is the same for those units regardless of what your parents do for a job. So that's what I would say first and foremost. Um, the second aspect of that is it's really, and I've discovered this since I've been here just simply because I've studied and I've asked and tried to really understand. They don't, the State Department doesn't say, we really you know, recommend you take this house at Falls Church. Um, the families that are State Department families choose Falls Church just like every other family that chose to be here. And, and one of the things that I really learned last year was that you know, if you have a student who really wants to uh, take a certain Mandarin program or something, you may choose Maryland to, to have a program um, at a different high school that we don't even offer. Um, people that choose Falls Church choose us for the same reasons as everybody else. But it really is, they're not placed here. It's not because their contract or their house is here. It, the, the families just choose to be here. And all of us in Northern Virginia have the same issues. Yeah. All right, with that, just wanted to say thank you once again to Dr. Jones, to Mr. Shields, uh, to Mr. Sharp, and all of the council and school board leaders who are here tonight. And uh, travel safe. If you have any follow-up questions, um, I believe some of them will be around for a couple of minutes. Oh, and the slides. Will we be able to post? Sure. Okay, and the same with the school. All right, the PTAs will post both PowerPoint presentations that you saw tonight for public access. Thanks. Good night.